I would like to uh, introduce uh, our um, guest speaker today to, uh, to the Friday talk for Center for Southeast Asian Study, Dr. Thu Zhang Nguyen um, from uh, Vietnam. She's from, uh, so we say, Uni National University of Vietnam. And uh, now she's doing her uh, post uh, postdoc uh, research at uh, University of Pennsylvania. And Dr. Zhang got her uh, PhD from University of Queensland in Australia. So um, yeah, so she's been everywhere globally. <laughs> and uh, but today she's going to um, talk about uh, Vietnam. And um, the topic is about uh, television in post-reform Vietnam national media and market is also and she's going to talk about the book that is going to be published soon in October. And I will just uh, briefly introduce, and then I would leave the floor for uh, Dr. Thu Zhang. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so hello, everyone. I'm thrilled to be here. Um, let me introduce a bit about myself. I, I was born in Hanoi. Uh, and I grew up there, I got my full education there before I went to Australia for my PhD. So I used to teach in a journalism school for 10 years and used to work as a journalist for three years. Um, now I'm um, working as a postdoctoral research at the Center for Global Research and um, for Global Communication at UPenn. And um, I'm so glad that I make the way from Vietnam to here because normally you won't find a center that combines the inside of area study with a critical studies like the center that you pen. Um, so today I'm going to talk about my up like forthcoming book. It is actually out in in two days, three days in next Tuesday. Um, so this book is basically like my thesis, right? And um, I'm glad that it's out, because after six or seven years thinking about the same idea, you sort of just want to get rid of it. Like, I just want to forget it. Um, and now at um, UPenn, I'm uh, doing a new research on the relationship between precarity, um, actually precarization, motherhood, and social media in Vietnam. Um, so this book um, is all about television, and it asks um, the question of how television, like, um, being the new popular form of mass communication in Vietnam changed the way Vietnamese people think about themselves as Vietnamese. So it asks us the question of the relationship between the nation, the media, and a new organizer of life in Vietnam, the market. Um, <coughs> this is me. Um, this picture was taken in... Uh, 1989, so it's three years after the reform. I was seven, and I was sitting on my mother's lap, and because we were living in the so-called collective residence, a term under socialist housing system, so my house was tiny. It's like one-tenth of the, this room. It's very small, and it was very messy, so my dad sort of putting a canvas to cover up the messy, you see the flower um, cloth behind, but he didn't cover one thing. The third character in the picture, a television set. So that one, the white one, was a 14-inch JVC, and in Japan it was literally trash. So we call it trash TV. But when it got imported to Vietnam, it was the most precious item, like in not only in my house but in the whole neighborhood. Every night, people come to my house to watch television. Um, so, um, and if you see it three years after my mom and my dad bought this television, my mom didn't keep the foam things underneath because she just wanted to keep it new. It's something that nobody should touch. It was so expensive, uh, and, and we were so proud of that. So I think I'm the member of the generation, possibly the first one, and I think the last generation in Vietnam that literally grew up with the television set at home. Like someone who was born 10 years earlier than me would grow up without television because it was under terrible condition of war and poverty. Someone who was born 15 years after me, let's say my daughter, not 15, like 25 years younger than me. Um, she grew up with iPad, iPhone, and Google. 
uh, we, she really never really watches television. So I just think about, um, like it's sort of my inspiration to tell the story of the first and also the last Vietnamese generation that know what it means to grow up with a television set at home. Sometimes it's three sets, it's not just one, right? Because at some homes in Vietnam, there might be three, four sets of television. No longer, but used to be in the past. Um, so in this talk, I'm going to talk very briefly about the context and the framework. In my book, um, I talk at length about that because the context is so important. But here, I don't have time for that. So I, I, and then I will be focusing on the three case studies of two dramas for the first case study and then a talk show and uh, a reality show. And I will conclude by some key findings uh, before we move on for the Q&A. So talking about the context, television in Vietnam is all about um, politics, right? It has a very deeply politicized history. The first television network was launched in the South in 1966, fully aided by the US. Actually, they had two channels, and one was in English, and it's just like specifically for the US force, and the other one it was for um, Southern um, Vietnamese people. So it's part of the Cold War politics, right when the South had its television network, the North gonna have its similar thing, right? So in 70, they launched the first television trial in Hanoi, and um, now it is considered the founding day of Vietnamese television, which means that in, 90s, in 1975, after the fall of Saigon, the Northern regime came and took over the Southern network and erased all the history of the South, uh, like of, of, of Southern television. About 10 years after the war, during the 1980s, um, there is television, there was television, but basically there was not. Like in the sense that there was not like enough television sets and um, there's an extreme shortage of, of, of electricity. Um, so the milestone, the very important milestone is 1991. This is um, about six, seven years after the reform. Um, and I talk, I spent a whole chapter on this. Uh, we had the rich also cry. For those of you who don't know this one, it's a very famous Mexican telenovela, 100 episode. And it was extremely popular across the whole post and late socialist world, in China, in Russia, in many other Eastern European countries. So the rich also cry was uh, broadcast every day on uh, Vietnam on the national channel, and it was so popular that they said that the Hanoian street was just absent in the afternoon. It reduced significantly the rate of robbery because people stay at home, including the robbers, to wait for one episode of this one. Now, when we think about this, um, the idea that the rich can also cry is actually quite discursively new because just 10 years before, there's no rich people in Hanoi. Like, the idea that the rich and money can bring sadness is something new. And in 1991, we also have the first installation of the national satellite system, which means that for the first time in its very short history, Vietnamese uh, television can be watched simultaneously across the whole national territory. So if we think through the lens of Benedict Anderson, we can think that television started serving as a uh, technology of nationhood that allows some sort of imagined communities that was different from what was imagined through print and through radio. In 94, we had the first Vietnamese te television dramas, 96, first game show. Nowadays, we have a saturation of television channels and genres and formats. With about $8 a month, you can watch almost all international channels, and like BBC, CNN, with about 30 minutes delay for political screening, and also for entertainment, so Vietnamese viewers are simultaneously watch a Game of Thrones with um, US viewers, um, maybe a little bit late, a few days late, and certainly with cultural censorship, so much less nudity and sex. Um. So in this book, I'm sort of challenging two stereotypical assumptions about Vietnam. First is the state-centric uh, view about the uh, severe censorship of the party over the media in Vietnam. Now, this is not wrong. The state always wants to control everything, right? They want to control the kitchen, the women, the kids, and the media. 
But when the market started emerging as a um, new facilitator of the media pr practice in Vietnam, the zone of uh, mediation was just much expanded. And the sole focus on the role of the party state is actually reductionist. The second stereotype is the idea that Vietnamese nation and Vietnamese nationalism is all about war, is all about heroism and political conflicts. It was time when actually nationalism in Vietnam was very hot, very radical, but now we are a peaceful country. So how the nation is formed in the new era is a question unanswered if we keep focusing on the question of the war and political antagonism. So in order to uh, challenge these assumptions, I'm sort of looking at the nation or nationalist practices as situated forms of culture government in a Foucauldian sense. And uh, by which I mean um, nationalist practice is an arrangement or an arranging process of discursive and non-discursive elements in making sense of and organizing life in the name of the country. So the key question is what are the new thinkable, sayable, and feelable about nationhood and able by post-reform television? So um, because there's absolutely no study of Vietnamese media after the reform, like no form, no books at all. There's several articles, but there's no book. So the only way that I can do is to focus on the case studies because there were too, way too many things to talk about. So I, I choose only three case studies. The first one is the comparative analysis of two soap operas, Han Noi Yan and the city stories. And the theme of this case study is how memorial practice of nostalgia shapes the way Vietnamese people um, feel belonging to the nation in the post-reform time. The first drama, Hanoi Yan, was, this one was actually the first television drama made by Vietnamese producer. It was in 1996. Uh, and in this one, the story tells, uh, like it's a story of a couple, the nurse, a nurse and an engineer. So they fought together um, during the Vietnam War. So when the war ends, the couple continue to be army uh, like people, they live in the army neighborhood and soon the reform changed people's life and the couple find themselves in poverty. Like the heroes of the past cannot earn money in the new society, the top is like the very much like chaos, new chaos that um, soldiers cannot make sense of. So the husband was stuck in that uh, situation. He was so nostalgic. He, he, he keeps thinking about his past. He keeps connecting with his veteran friends. He fails to make money. The wife um, have to take the role of the breadwinner. So she quits her job as an army nurse. He, she goes to Eastern um, Europe, earn a lot of money. Three years after that, she returns home. She no longer loves her husband. So it's typical dramatic, sort of melodramatic imagination, right? She falls, um, she falls for another business pe person. And at the end, um, so, well, so what the problem in this drama is that it, it is extremely nostalgic and the husband is stuck in the past, like the past of socialism and heroism. And when he's stuck there, he has no future, right? Because he cannot earn money, it cannot be respected by his wife. The wife, the moment that she decided to depart uh, for, German, uh, for Germany, she actually rejected her socialist past so that he ca she can seek um, a new future. And she, she does, like, is successful. But when she returns, her future doesn't have a past because she already rejects it. So the husband has a past, but there's no future. The wife has a future and the present, but that present and future doesn't have a past. The socialist past, whatever it means to the wife and the husband, has failed the couple terribly. So there's no happy ending. In the original novel by Chu Lai, one of very famous Vietnamese army writers, um, she committed suicide and she died. Uh, the lover uh, goes insane and the husband stays in the house, the new house, uh, built by her new money and in total despair. So in the drama, the director changes a bit because it's too tragic. Um, so they committed suicide, but both survived. And the lover returns to Eastern Europe, and she stay. And the, the final scene, she was actually stand in, the, uh, like in front of the door of her house. And we don't know. It's an open ending. We don't know if the couple reconciles or not. But talking from the memorial point of view, there's no way that they can reconcile, because they don't share anything. 
They don't share future or past. So in, um, it becomes quite clear that the nostalgia of flavor here is quite bitter because for the heroes of the past, the future does no longer belong to them. In the war, they promised a lot about the future. None of these promises is made for the heroes of the past. Business people are the new heroes. It's not the socialists, veterans. So if we don't have a past, how can we have a future? And in the absence of a compatible past for the marketization, we need to invent one, right? So that's the second case studies. Um, the CD story was made in 2001. And this one is quite long. It had 21 episode because at that time Vietnamese television producers were much more experienced in producing like longer one. The previous one was only three episode. In this one we see all details of the story are centered on the story of money, love and culture tradition. There's no war in this one. Absolutely no war. Um, it tells the story of a man, a retired culture officer and he lives in a very beautiful colonial house <laughs> in the center of Hanoi. So it's huge money, right? But he's very poor because the house was just like inheritance. He lives with a blind daughter, so she cannot see, which means that she's pure. She's, she's not contaminated by the world. So these two vulnerable subjects living and, and, and get protected from the house. And their life is disturbed when the evil son returned from Eastern Europe. So in like Eastern European money was a very popular motive in the first decade after the reform because Eastern Europe was the main source of wealth in the north at that time. The son wants to colonize the house and turn it into the headquarter of his international cosmetic <laughs> company. So certainly the father and the daughter disagree, right? Because for them, money is not important. Money is I only important when you can keep the culture tradition in the of the house. And if it means that, if having money means that you have to erase the, the house from its, um, its uh, traditional beauty, then they would reject that. So the um, elder son uh, signs a contract with a friend so that that friend will seduce the girl. And when the girl get married with that guy, uh, she's out of the house for a new life and w at that point it's easier to get rid of the father and the plans go very well um, everyone was sort of surround uh, sur start surrounding the the elder son until the last episode the man um, like the 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 son-in-law changes his mind because he was transformed <laughs> by the girl's pure love and the father's wisdom so he revealed the evil scheme and put the elder son in shame so the, the elder son returns to Eastern Europe <laughs> and the son-in-law has everything, right? They has the girl, she ha he has the girl and he has the house. <laughs> mm. So this very typical melodrama um, with that the up and downs and a terrible tragedy and also very unexpected happy ending. The thing we can see here is that there's a reinvention of, of many values that were used to be denounced in the socialist era. A feudal anta on the top of the house is a key object in the movie, in the, in the drama, and it no longer signifies backwardness or reactionary as it was used to be during the socialist time. A colonial house no longer signifies enemy. It's actually the top real estate in Vietnam now. Um, men and women are no longer soldiers. There's absolutely no soldiers in this drama. Uh, and we see a search for a better yesterday because if the socialist past can no longer work for the marketization, they seek for a new um, a revival of, of, of the, c the existing meanings about colonial and feudal times. Like they seek to use the repertoire of fantasy and desires and reuse them for a new uh, purpose. And uh, here we see a sort of self-orientalist strategy that Iowa Wong talks a lot about. Um, and we see when Asian uh, countries use their own um, traditional values to promote themselves and to advance themselves in uh, the age of uh, global trading. The second case study is the famous talk show Contemporaries. And this is one of the longest, actually it is the longest talk show in Vietnam and very famous. Um, 
The key theme is self-advancement and nationalist responsibility. And here we see a, a shift from socialist moralism to a sort of neoliberal ethics of self-formation. In this talk show, you will see the host, that big one, a very famous female television uh, practitioner in Vietnam. She's currently the leader of VTV3. VTV3, VTV3 is the key entertainment channel of Vietnamese television, so she's still like working. Um, each talk features a one-to-one -one, um, dialogue, so it's a personality talk. Um, it lasts for about one hour, and it's um, mainly about asking the guests to share their story of how they get to be successful. And those are called contemporaries, like those are typical Vietnamese heroes of the reform. So who are they? Over 11 years, they invite more than 400 guests, actually almost 500. And in my loose categorization, 33% are talented professionals, doctor, teacher, artists, singers, inventors. They're about 30% business people. So like CEO of huge company or just like the boss of a very successful startup. 13% are people with a philanthropist purpose, normally often related to those with a disability or HIV. So that already about 75%. The rest uh, are spent on those with like a socialist pa like story, like old socialist heroes, anti-corruption activists, only 2%, and foreigners. So at first sight, it looks like the show is very sort of egalitarian, but it gives more priority to certain group of guests. So if we look at the narrative of heroic people in the past and the way this uh, show uh, constructs its uh, contemporary, we can see a vast difference, if not like total contrast. In the past, um, the heroes of the nation are mainly politicians and warriors. And they are normally represented as extraordinary figures, erased of all personal marker and everything is considered to be sacrificed. So you sacrifice yourself, your success, your life, your family for the nation. And it's doctrine based. Like the case of Ho Chi Minh is very typical. He doesn't have a life. He's the uncle and father of the whole nation, but he doesn't have a child. So the personalized story and contemporaries, on the other hand, is just like presenting people as ordinary one. So they actually ignore politicians for two reasons. First, inviting politicians on television is risky. No one wants to go on television, <laughs> particularly Vietnamese politicians, right? Because so there's a lot of censorship. So it's good for the producers to ignore them. But also they explain that I don't want to invite politicians if they don't want to share their ordinary stories. If they if they go there and they talk like big terms, it's not like they don't want that. So the top politician that appear in this show is only the Minister of Education and he was presented as an ordinary man. It's not like big man. And the key focus of the show is personal success. It's always like how do you get to that point? How do you be so rich? How do you be so smart? So it's all about the self. It's not about the erasures of the self. And it's very much skill-based because the topic, the slogan of the show is the key to success. That's the sl slogan. Um, so we see um, that the neoliberal um, terms about self-formation is everywhere in the show. Terms such as uh, never giving up, like investing in yourself, thinking big, being your own boss, learning from your mistake, transforming your destiny, that sort of inspiration porn, right? But it's not just about that, it's coupled with nationalist ethics. So these terms are always, almost always combined with things like Vietnamese brands, Vietnamese quality, Vietnamese dream, and Vietnamese values and things like that. It's always about Viet. Like if you <coughs> are good, you contribute directly to your nation. So the nation or the national runs within the personal and the personal directly makes up the nation. So that personalizing tendency is actually quite different from the collectivizing tendency in the socialist era. And we also see a detour from political collectivism because people don't talk about collective. 
They talk about person, and they think that if you advance personally, it's automatically um, an advancement for the nation. They never talk about the fact that if some people are advancing, <laughs> most of the time a majority of others which is going down. So here we see a convenient absence of politics, and the nation is increasingly presented as, an, uh, as something like an ensemble of non-threatening fragments rather than a politicized entity. And as such, um, nationalist practices um, conducted by television producers are normally a sick a minimization of unnecessary encounters, particularly against the state, whereas they are still like, capable of telling their story, which is actually market sensitive, but politically benign. Here's the quote from uh, one of the most typical guests of the show. He got invited twice. One in once in a like dialogue with Miss Luan, the host, and the other one in a dialogue with a very big group of students. And during the show with the student, he said, "If you would, if you travel overseas, like me now, right, you will see that people there, which means like you are here, um, people there don't have to care about basic needs in their lives, so they can think bigger than us. The gap between our country and others is too wide." Our generation must try to show the world the image of Vietnam, so national branding, but also personal branding. It's not only a nation of heroic wars, but of wealth and talent. When a Japanese goes abroad, she or he has self-confidence, but a Vietnamese could not feel a similar thing yet. So here we can see several nationalist logics. Uh, first is that belatedness is seen as both personal and and national, and the post-colonial haunt of, of third world belatedness, of inferiority is still uh, deeply found in Vietnamese television programs. And most people talk about the shared past of poverty and the shared future of global competition, and also the responsibility of every single Vietnamese people to leave the national brand. It's called like branding the nation in the name of the self. So the horizon of the Vietnamese dream is globalization. So there's no antithetical connection between these two things, national and global. The third case study is also my most favorite one. It's the reality show As If We Never Parted. Um, and the theme is the production of trauma and the promise of healing and reconciliation. And in this um, particular show, we, sh we, we see the immersion of a new narrative about nationhood, which is central on the, 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 the problem of vulnerability and trauma instead of glory. So it's, it's actually a tremendous change because in the past, when you read Vietnamese media, particularly those on like official voices, it's all about glory. Like even everyone is dying, poverty, they still say good things about their country. But a public television program talking only about trauma is very rare and it's actually quite brave. So a bit about this one, it is a Vietnamese reality show and the mission is to reunite missing people. And until today, it's about 70,000 search requests and nearly 800 cases of actual reunion. And in this, um, this program features not only just television live program, but also a sort of combination of television um, broadcast, like announcements, website, hotline, a very large network of volunteers, and a professional team of detectives. So I'm going to present the story of Miss Ngoc, Mrs. Ngoc. Uh, Mrs. Ngoc is a Viet Cộc nurse. So in 1971, she was working in her jungle clinic in Pleiku, a city in the central highlands of Vietnam. Um, so at that time, the Southern Army attacked her clinic and kidnapped her three-year-old daughter. A few days after that, the helicopter came back and they sort of distributed the, lef uh, like the, the blackmail letters about her, her, her daughter. And that um, leaflet shows the image of the girl, which you see here. Yeah. Normally, the girl has long hair, but in that picture, she was shaved. Um, and they asked for, um, like, asked her and uh, asked for, a, 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 like, surrender, right? But she, Mrs. Ngoc and her comrade certainly um, never agree. So the girl went missing for 30 years. In 2007, 
Right after the show was launched, Mrs. Ngoc was one among the first to submit a, a search request, and she appeared live on television telling her story, like a testimony actually, in her own voice. And at that time, the daughter was watching television too, and she recognized that photo. And she made the phone call to the station, and they got reunited also live on television, right? They were kept in two different rooms, and it was all in tears. Um, the girl was actually raised in a pagoda, and that's why the monk, very smart one, shaved her head. Because he, he thinks that if the head is bald, then the mother have a hint that, like, please go and look for your kid in the pagodas. And they did so, but never really found her. It was just heartbreaking. Like every time I watch this show, my daughter know, right? She knew. Oh, mom, you're crying again. <laughs> it's a hundred shows, and it's just like weeping. <sighs> Another story of Mr. Viet. Mr. Viet is a southerner, and in 1981, he risked the life of his whole family escaping the southern socialist regime just installed after the war. And when he was on the boat, he got kidnapped by Thai pirates, and they took everything. They took the money, the gold, and they kept the boy three months. Everyone was released, right? So he made his way to California. Right after he settled his family there, his life there, he started like, looking for the boy in vain. So he submitted the search request to the Vietnam National Television. So it's his enemy, right? Normally, California people do not like northerners. Um, so the show conducted a search that is actually cross-country and cross-continent and found a boy in the shore of Thailand. And this boy, um, it was very touching because they look similar. Like the affective um, register that the shows bring on us was just striking because you see human features that are similar. You don't, like the bloodline is there. Um, but the boy was actually raised by the kidnappers. So because that pirates, they don't have a kid, so they keep the boy. So the man was actually faced with a very, like a dilemma, right? He wants to take a revenge, but the kidnappers are now beloved parents of the boy. So the question of reconciliation comes through very strongly. How do you continue to live when the legacy of the past is actually the hope for the future? So it is basically the story of that you see on the shows. Like all the missing was deeply informed by national tragedies. And it was tear all around, right? Viewers are crying, reunited people are crying, the hosts are crying. So in this, uh, this one, we see the sort of the reinvention of the national biography by real face, real name, and real feeling. And, and they do that by a blending of close up, uh, sad movie, a sad music, a vintage photos, and as such, um, through a very, um, it's, it's a very typical uh, quality of reality television. It allows viewers to recognize the past, much predating their birth, and in so doing, they actually entwine their personal feeling into the national history. Um, so as such, uh, this program works as a biopolitical technology of affect and also of a nationhood. And we see again the history of human vulnerability is um, emerging and, and replacing the previous uh, focus on socialism, um, glory. It's not just about the time, but the space of nationhood is also transformed because this reality shows uses a lot of travel logs. So it allows viewers to occupy and embody the lens of the cameraman and go around the country as a rescuer and looking for the lost people. So it moves people across the countries. And as such, it's sort of bringing the homeless trajectories and turn it into the map of the nation. It's not physical map, um, but it's the map of traumas, which I call it pathocartography of the nation. So healing becomes possible. Normally, healing is not possible in Vietnam because the party state does not recognize that there's pain. It's all sacrifice, right? And when you sacrifice, you shouldn't complain. But healing becomes possible when the pain is acknowledged. But here it becomes uh, acknowledged only when it is private. So it remains private achievement. Public mourning ends at the televised spectacles of happy ending, returning home, and that's the end. 
right? There's no talking about the systematic violence in the name of the nation, in the name of the homeland. It's just like, okay, now you have a home, and that's it. So the home serves as an idealized space of emotional compatibility. So if Mrs. Ngoc and Mr. Viet um, meet in a normal political context, they are enemies. But in these programs, they're on the same boat, like they are parents, love being kid. There's no politics in this. So they're bypassing political justice and they see personal love and agent of change. So instead of providing um, actual political discussion, and actual political justice, they actually enable a sensation of justice and a democracy of feeling. So majority of the missing people are poor, weak, voiceless, socially neglected and politically abused unless and until they, their story got onto television to confirm what it means to have a true home and to belong to a motherland. So they have um, some sort of pain-killing affect for viewers and also a bit for themselves too. Normally they don't have any change in the status, or, but they have a better, they have someone else <laughs> to look for them, not the society or the political system though. So the key findings, um, is the first um, nationalism remains. Vietnamese people continue to be deeply nationalist. But instead of the tendency to, to politicize um, the nation, we see a very strong um, tendency of cultural, like culturalizing it, um, particularly in television when uh, political debates are sort of censored. So in the age of what we call the post-political, or the illusion of the non-ideological, we see that the nation is going banal, like going banal in the first case study. The second case study is that it's going personal or individual. The last case study, it goes into the body, right? It goes into your tear, it's going to your trembling reaction when you see a testimony. So as such, the nations or nationalist practice are getting into a wider, deeper, more dispersed, less radical, but actually more natural and as such is more inescapable. And we also see a lot of resistance, most in mostly implicit, like Vietnamese national uh, television practitioners are deeply in trouble with the state. They got censored a lot and they're not happy about that. So normally they render political unimportant. They talk about something else. So that's implicit resistance in itself. But at the same time it's complicity because they don't talk about politics. So how how can they cope with the state if you don't talk about the politics? That's all the state does. So sovere uh, socialist sovereignty and neoliberal governmentality might target two different things, but they are actually quite compatible. There's no, both the discourse on the state, uh, sorry, the discourse um, um, on by the market and the discourse of propaganda, like marginalized genuine political discussion. Again, the national and the global, the relationship, I think many people already talk about that, but in this um, book I confirm that it's more compatible than antithetical. Most of the time for countries like Vietnam, like developing country, in order to advance in the global ranking, they have to go through the finto of the national. So the cost of socialist failure in Vietnam is not about the implicit resistance to all political norms, but also about the uncritical celebration of neoliberal freedom in the name of the feeling self. Thank you. In this reunion, the last show, the reunification show, do we have any cases of people in the South trying to find, who had fled the North in the mid 50s, trying to find members of their family back in, in the North, or vice versa, members of the family in the North trying to find members who had fled to the South? Yes. Um, the 1954, um, like political migrations a key topic in this show, right? So there are different waves of political migrations in Vietnam and the, the end of the French resistance. Like there's a big group of Vietnamese people going to the south, most of them like Catholics, and, um, uh, and also going to abroad. So those people appear a lot 
on, on these shows. And the other political wave of migration is the bot people. Um, some of them appear in the show, like Mr. Viet, but only in like affective register. We're not talking about politics, but it is the first time that the Vietnamese public television acknowledged that there is such a trauma. Um, but the interesting thing is the fall of Saigon. Like someone like me grew up in the north of Vietnam and learning historical lessons for 12 years in my like public school. I never knew the tragic fall of Saigon. Um, so they actually spent about 15 shows focused only on that. Because in the central highlands, um, the southern army is just flooding, right? And on the way they fleet, people are going with them. And they lost their kids. It's always like the whole family, 10 kids. And the baby was the one who get lost easier, right? Most of them were just like raised by ethnic minority people. So the 10 shows about, 15 shows about that, and it was just tragic because for the first time, someone quite intellectual like me, I never got to know that. But now it's just like reappear on television in real voice. So, uh, and also the baby lives and um, the, the famine in 1945, they have like five shows on that. And also there's several shows of people scattering in Africa, this, um, the Pacific Islands, like the legacy of the French um, colonial network, right? Some people were sent there in the 1930s, 1940. Most of them are almost like dying. So it's like the grand grand kid looking for the grand grandfather or something, never fight like each other. Sometimes they just found a picture, like a necklace or a letter. So it, it's profoundly national in that sense, but it's tragic. Yeah. So they do, do a lot of that. And there's a lot of censorship. And they survive that because the host, um, Tu Yuan, he's, she's very strong. Like she has a very long history of family business in the media and in the intellectual. So the party state sort of trusts her. Like you can do that without violating the political censors. So no one can do that except Tu Yuan actually, because she's very powerful. She's a powerful journalist. Wait, 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 please, please. <laughs> This is, this is being recorded, so we have to get it on. Are there advertisements, and do those ads relate to the shows? In other words, shows reach certain markets and... No. <laughs> the Vietnamese television is, like, it belongs to the state by law, right? So in Vietnam, television belonged to the state, but right after the reform, the state very actively outsourced the funding task to the market. So the whole Vietnamese television industry is financially independent. So when you touch on the question of advertising, advertisement, it actually it shows everything, right? All the money for these shows comes from the market. Um, so in order to do this show, the, like Tu Nguyen has to secure a sponsor. Um, and it used to be Viettel. Viettel is the top Vietnamese telecommunication company. But then later on, it has like construction companies and all sort of things. And um, television sponsorship and also concealed and unconcealed public relation networks are now the key funding source of Vietnamese media. So the key feature of Vietnamese media is not political censorship alone. It's the blatant com combination of political censorship and overt commercialization and commercial liberty. So you would see a very strict news on the party state, followed by a terrible celebrity endorsed <laughs> drama um, or reality show. It's just within two hours, you see the national television, you see everything. You see Dancing with the Star, and then after that you see news, and then you see uh, top-rated Vietnamese television dramas followed by Vietnam idols. So there's a mixture of political restriction, terrible ones, but it's getting loose and li like a little bit loose now, and um, advertisement liberty. So everything comes from money, and if the producer cannot secure the sponsorship, there's no way that the show is granted the permission to show, to be broadcast. There's no money from the party state except for news. It's completely, um, it, it actually Vietnam National Television went independent in their finance since 2005. 
So completely independent in terms of money. And it's actually a terrible thing because it put the journalists and the practitioners between the trap of political duty and the anxiety from the market. And both of these, the political duty to obey the state and, 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 and the fact that they have to earn money from the market to sustain their life, both of these marginalize like genuine political discussions. So um, if the party state facilitate the political thing, the non-political thing is actually belonging <laughs> to the business people. They have big voice in this. And in order to sustain these shows, um, it's, it's a big game for journalists. Like Tu Yuan herself, she has to like juggling a lot of things uh, in order to sustain these shows, like using personal network, um, begging for, <laughs> for some hour, uh, uh, like one hour a week or one hour a month from the, her boss, and managing a network of, of, of like outsource tasks to the private companies. So she has to do that and without killing herself. Um, hi, I just wanted to know like um, the other newer TV shows that are kind of like not in this case study. Like I know there's, there's like TV shows on like blind dating like a variety TV show on that and like um, The Voice Vietnam and there's some like um, there's some like dramas also where uh, they get some of the lead actors or whatever from like other countries like uh, Korea and China or something like that so I was thinking like how do those um, newer maybe younger kinds of media like fit in with what you have found? So the case studies when I do the justification for my case study selection there's several limitation actually limits instead of, I don't think that it's limitation, but first of all, it's very northern based. Uh, Southerners do not watch these things because they have very strong provincial network in the south and they watch melodrama like Gai Luong and they watch um, uh, comedies. They, they're not interested in news and when I interview television producers in the south, they say that um, we, we don't like northern people. Um, we have our own sort of we already developed distinctive taste and audienceship before the overtaking, like we are overtaken by the North. So the division is still there, culture division is still there. So that's the first thing about the case study. It's not comprehensive, right? It's in-depth in analyzed and analysis, but it's not comprehensive. So talking about the new generations, uh, we have to take into account that in 2000, the internet started emerging in Vietnam. And by 2009, it's already everywhere. So it's not just that the next generation do not watch television as the way we are, but also they transform the whole thing, uh, like the digital transform the whole thing, include the television and things like that. So suddenly there's a disconnection between our generation who actually directly grew up on the legacy of the war and the generation like my daughter knows nothing about the war. And they, they watch K-pop. If you know the drama Descendants of the Sun, yeah, it's the Big Bang in Vietnam, right? And Big Bang, by the way, is also another Big Bang <laughs> thing, right? In Vietnam, when they welcome Big Bang, the whole stadium, which is like maybe 40,000 people got fainted. So kids are totally disconnected, a majority of them. And shows on the commercial side are on the rise um, because they mean those shows are money. Without them, the television station was just gone staffed. So you see um, Vietnam Idols, Next Stop Model, MasterChef, um, like everything you see here, you see in Vietnam, but it's more blatant um, because there's no mediation, there's no explanation, there's no review. But at the same time, uh, when we say that, it sort of be becomes sort of pessimistic, right? but at the rise of social media, young people are very politically active too. So I can see someone who is watching K-pop and K-drama every night, but in daytime, they show deeply politically criti like critical message about the state. So I'm not interested, like, I, I'm, I'm not a, like I'm not doing any research about that, but what I mean is the next <coughs> generation is very much on the commercial sort of popular taste, but at the same time, they do not lose connection with the political landscape in Vietnam. How they do that, I don't know. 
but because I, I, but I see a group of young people very politically active, and they are very popular and cosmopolitan too. Um, um, so it, mm, so so in in order like answer your question, yes, those shows are actually overtaking those things. Yeah, and why I choose this thing, um, I call this the in between shows where you can see the tangled network of the state, the market and the agency of the producers. If you go on the too much like commercialized one, you only see the market. If you go on too much like news or documentaries, you only see the state. But if you, if you look for famous programs that are some sort of in between, they run by market money, but they have some ethical stand um, by like, because the, the practitioners are very, um, they're haunted by the ethical <laughs> nationalist uh, task of telling the nation's stories. And also they are still controlled by the political taboos imposed uh, from the top by the state. So in order to reveal those tangled network, I choose to, uh, to pick those programs. They are very famous, but they are not the top rated one. The best watched, the most watched pro program in Vietnam last year was The Voice. Because the, the launching pro, like the launching show attracts, I think, 14% the population watching, which is amazing, because 14% means that for every 30 seconds, it costs, um, like the advertisement will cost about $100,000. So, um, so yes, the commercialization is terrible. But, but we have to take into account that there's a merging of digital resistance on Facebook simultaneously. Television does not exist alone anymore. It's always in a tangled network with other forms of, and of, of com communication. So I would struck you, um, case studies were what, soap opera, talk show, reality show, right? And those have a kind of, those are sort of transnational genres that also to a certain degree may become packaged with a certain kind of conventional narrative. Huh? Um, and I'm just wondering, are there other, are there genres of television in Vietnam that are kind of peculiar, local, right? Idiosyncratic. Um, especially maybe in the beginning of television, right? Before all these other models of genres and ways of telling stories and kinds of stories appeared or um, his, uh, you know, if you think about I see, yeah. different things, there's, you know. You now, uh, when we think about the position of Vietnam in the media landscape, we have to just put it in the post-colonial lens, right? Because Vietnam is always belated in its adoption of medias. So um, most of the time, they don't have anything distinctive Vietnam. Normally, it's the fantasy of Vietnamese te television producer to say that this is uniquely Vietnam, but you can always chase the history of where it comes from. Um, so but there's something that was maybe unintentional, but it's very distinctive. For example, in Viet Vietnam is the only country where they call television drama film, right? There's no distinction between television and cinema, which was terrible, right? Um, <laughs> when I do like archival research, everything about television dramas is put on under the section of cinema. Why? Because for a long time, cinematic movies for big screen is shown on small screen. And it's always started with the, say with the saying, like, this is a big screen movie. Please do not adjust your small screen <laughs> because <laughs> it looks weird on television. Um, so for a long time, Vietnamese people see epic cinematic stories on small screens. And it comes to the thing that they cannot differentiate between cinema and television. Um, and, the, um, and also we have a tradition of doing documentaries um, that, that, that have the, the in like inherit the legacy from Soviet um, training. So they're very good, they're very good. Um, many movies in the socialist <coughs> time that shown on television are very good too. Like talking about genre, it's not talking about ideology because that is, um, well, well I ideology is important certainly, but I mean technically it's very important. Other than that, I don't think that um, Vietnamese people 
uh, develop any sort of unique Vietnamese genre. Most of the genres here, interestingly enough, is not global. It's not from the West. It's actually from Russia. Mm. Yeah. So globalization for Vietnamese media is reflected through its connection with Eastern European countries. Uh, how? Because Tu Uyên for the reality show, Luan for the talk show, and the current director of Vietnam National Television, all of them were trained <laughs> in the I like in Soviet countries. So they bring on this thing back home. Um, that reality show, uh, as if we never t par um, parted, was inspired by the show uh, in Russia, Wait for Me. So, um, so my argument is globalization is it's actually happening deeply in Vietnam, but it does not take the, the, the normal route. It goes through different contacts of the Vietnamese people with the external world, like th their contact, particularly the contact with the, the Soviet bloc. And interestingly enough, the socialist legacy, right, is all about the Cold War. Actually, the best resource for Vietnamese um, television practitioner to go for a capitalist future. So it's all built on. Thank you.